Hello students, welcome to the lecture on training. And after the lecture, we will be able to learn the following objectives. Understand the training concept. Explain training functions and needs, organization and management. Discuss training process. Give overview on training program and role of stakeholders. Define training assessment. Understand competency mapping. Let us start with a brief introduction to training. Training and development play an important role in the effectiveness of organizations and to the experiences of people in work. Training has implications for productivity, health and safety at work, and personal development. All organizations employing people need to train and develop their staff. Most organizations are cognizant of this requirement and invest effort and other resources in training and development. Included within this process is how organizations identify training needs and select, implement, and evaluate training programs. Training is the process of teaching employees the basic skills they need to perform their jobs or for developing additional skills. The firm's training programs must make sense in terms of the company's strategic goals. For example, if one of the goals of the company is to expand its international market, then one of the things they may focus on is training their employees in multiple languages. Also, training is part of the larger issue of performance management. This is an integrated, goal-oriented approach to assigning, training, assessing, and rewarding employees' performance. Managers set goals for their employees, and training is one of the ways an organization helps an employee meet those goals. The training process includes these five steps. It is important that each step in the process be completed thoroughly because each builds on the other. The more time and effort spent on the previous step, the better the next steps can be. Step 1, Needs Analysis, identifies the training needs of an employee. The two main ways of identifying those needs are through a task analysis and a performance analysis. The task analysis is a detailed study of a job to identify the specific skills required, especially for new employees. A task analysis record form can also be used. Here is an example of this form for a printing press operator. The task analyses contain the following information, a task list, when and how often each task is performed, the quantity and quality of performance expected, the working conditions, the skills or knowledge required, and where those can be best learned. The second type of needs analysis is a performance analysis. The goal here is to verify if there is a performance deficiency and to determine whether that deficiency should be corrected through training or through some other means, such as transferring the employee. There are several methods that can be used to identify an employee's training needs, including 360-degree performance reviews, job-related performance data, observations by supervisors or other specialists, and tests of things like job knowledge and skills. When beginning the discussion of what types of training methods to use, there are several tips to keep in mind to make the training more effective. First, the learning needs to be meaningful. Material that is meaningful is usually easier for trainees to understand and remember. For example, it is important at the start of training to provide a bird's eye view of the material to be presented. It is also valuable to use a variety of familiar examples and to organize the information so it can be presented logically and in meaningful units. Second, it is imperative to design the training to make it easy for the skills being learned to transfer from the training site to the job site. This can be accomplished by maximizing the similarity between the training environment and the work situation and by providing time for adequate practice. It is also important to provide a heads up or some preparatory information that lets trainees know what problems or situations may occur on the job. Lastly, it is important to motivate the learner. This is easily done by defining for the learner why the training is important and how it will benefit them. People learn best by doing, so provide as much realistic practice as possible and allow them to learn at their own pace. Trainees also learn best when the trainers immediately reinforce correct responses. With this in mind, take a look at several different methods organizations can use when designing their training. I will not spend time discussing all of them as you can read about them in your text, but understand that each method has advantages and disadvantages. Thus, depending on the situation, each method can be a valuable tool for teaching employees new skills and behaviors. Step 3 is the validation process. By now the term validity should be a familiar one. We discussed this in great detail during the selection chapter when we talked about how organizations create valid selection measures for hiring new employees. 
In order to determine a training's validity, the company must test the training on a sample of employees to see if those who receive the training have better performance on the job than those who did not receive the training. This sampling process should be conducted on multiple groups to make sure the training is valid. Implementation, step four, is the easiest to do if all previous steps have been done well. Now we simply need to train the employees that need to learn this skill or behavior. It is important to schedule the training at a time when the employee is fresh and that the training is broken down into small segments to lower the chance of fatigue. Step five, evaluating the training, is the most overlooked step. In many instances, organizations will spend a lot of time and resources on the first four steps and then completely forget about what is arguably the most important part of the training process. My point is that it makes no sense for organizations to spend hundreds or even tens of thousands of dollars on designing a training program to not have any proof that the training actually has proven results. There are four basic ways to measure training effectiveness. The first is the trainee's reaction to or perception of the training. Did they like it? Did they enjoy it? These reactions are very similar to the types of evaluations you complete at the end of every semester on your teachers. The second way is to measure the trainee's learning. This can be done by testing the individual's knowledge of the material covered. Third is to assess the trainee's behavior. Are they using the skills or behavior they learn in the training in the actual work environment? Lastly, organizations should measure the results or outcomes of the training. In other words, did those who participated in the training actually improve their job performance? This is an example of a time series experiment. Before training, the company measures employee performance several times. In a perfect world, this is what all organizations hope to see as a result of training. Ultimately, what organizations want to see is a significant increase in employee performance, which is illustrated on the right side of the graph. In the end, if organizations can't track this and understand how training is affecting performance, then the training is not as effective as it could be. In conclusion, today we have discussed the basics of designing and implementing a training program. It is a complicated and time-consuming process, but in the end, a well-constructed training program is worth the effort, which must include all five steps. Let's discuss the training concept. The training concept deals with the creation process of ideal training offers. The training concept is categorized into three phases. Analysis, Design and Development, Implementation. Analysis. During the first step, the analysis deals individually with the points capacity planning as well as the analysis of the target group. Moreover, the analysis contains the preparation of schedules and a didactic concept as well as the assessment of available documentation. Design and Development. After carrying out the analysis of the current state, one immediately deals with the design and development of the training. This means diverse activities like the development of complete training concepts and individual training modules, as well as their integration into existing concepts. Implementation. The project's realization happens on different levels. Our service incorporates the conception, the design, and the text up to the point of printable invitations for the participants as well as their shipping. Training and business strategy. The study explored the concept of aligning training with business strategy. At the heart of the variations in training functions is not just the level of demand, but rather differences in criticality of business need, speed of response required, what the business can afford at any particular time, stage in the organization life cycle, competitiveness of the labor market. Diverse freedom methods. One major source of diversity has been the arrival of successive waves of immigrants. Waves seldom absorbed without some degree of stress and even conflict, but which have also enriched and developed the identities of both migrants and hosts project focuses on one specific set of new diversities, derived from large-scale immigration over the last five or six decades. Finding efficient structures. The training department requires information about competency learning to determine the effectiveness of training delivery and approach. Questionnaires. Questionnaires offer a structured tool that may provide both 
quantitative and qualitative information about employee reactions to the training event. Knowledge review. Knowledge reviews offer an objective means of determining whether training content has been learned. Knowledge reviews refer to a general group of assessment tools in which employees read questions and respond in writing. Observation. Observation is another evaluation method that provides information regarding employee reactions to the training. Training department personnel should observe employee interaction, level of engagement with training instructors, and responses to course content. Skill gap analysis. The skill gap analysis can be administered using a survey instrument. A skill gap occurs when an employee is rated with a lower level of skill than the position requires. This assessment should be used for informational purposes only and should not be linked to the employee evaluation process. Let's move on and take a look at the training process. Many training organizations do not perform at the level they should because they are not focused on process management. All organizations offer training, but some never get to the detailed level of managing the processes of learning. The process for developing performance-based training includes the following 10 steps. Define the target population for training. List the tasks to be performed by the target population on the job. List the skills and knowledge needed to do the tasks. Select the skills and knowledge to be taught. These make up the training objectives. Organize the selected skills and knowledge into suitable teaching units, modules, and develop the training design, including brief outlines of module content and planned training methods. Draft expanded outlines of modules, including instructional objectives main body of text, and descriptions of training methods, examples, and exercises. Experts provide realistic examples and information for use in exercises. Draft the complete modules, facilitator guidelines, and course director guidelines. Field test the training materials. Revise and finalize training materials based on the field test. Establishing Needs Analysis Many needs assessments are available for use in different employment contexts. Sources that can help to determine which needs analysis is appropriate for situation are Organizational Analysis An analysis of the business needs or other reasons the training is desired. What is the organization overall trying to accomplish? The important questions being answered by this analysis are who decided that training should be conducted, why a training program is seen as the recommended solution to a business problem. Person analysis. Analysis dealing with potential participants and instructors involved in the process. The important questions being answered by this analysis are who will receive the training and their level of existing knowledge on the subject what their learning style is, and who will conduct the training. Work analysis, task analysis. This is an analysis of the job and the requirements for performing the work. Also known as a task analysis or job analysis, this analysis seeks to specify the main duties and skill level required. This helps ensure that the training which is developed will include relevant links to the content of the job. Performance analysis. Are the employees performing up to the establishment standard? If performance is below expectations, can training help to improve this performance? Is there a performance gap? Content analysis. Analysis of documents, laws, and procedures used on the job. This analysis answers questions about what knowledge or information is used on the job. This information comes from manuals, documents, or regulations. It is important that the content of the training does not conflict or contradict job requirements. Training Suitability Analysis Analysis of whether training is the desired solution. Training is one of several solutions to employment problems. However, it may not always be the best solution. It is important to determine if training will be effective in its usage. Cost-Benefit Analysis 
Effective training results in a return of value to the organization that is greater than the initial investment to produce or administer the training. Developing training programs and manuals. One may have spent time sitting through training sessions of questionable value. Now the boss has assigned him to develop a training program on the job for the rest of the department. Analyze the training need. Who is the audience? When one develops a training program on the job, one will take a look at what knowledge, skills, and attitudes the students need upon completing the program versus what knowledge, skills, and attitudes they have now. Design the training program. The design phase consists of identifying learning objectives that describe what the student should be able to do upon completion of the training, and how these objectives will be measured. Develop the training program. In the development phase, use the objectives and other materials created during the design phase to flesh out outline and develop the training program. Implement the training program. The implementation phase is sometimes called the delivery phase. In this phase, teach the training program to the students. Whether the instruction takes place outline, in the classroom, or through another method. Deliver the training program. With advancing technologies and an increasing focus on workplace learning, more and more decisions need to be made about training design and delivery. And it is helpful to consider these and other questions before designing and delivering a training. Evaluate the training program. The evaluation phase determine if the students obtain the knowledge, skills, or attitudes one identified as the goal during the analysis phase. The term stakeholder is increasingly used in discussions on planning, public policy, and governance. Stakeholder refers to social groups or institutions that have an interest in the policy or planning questions under discussion. Role of organization. Organization roles control access to the content and tools within an organization. Organization roles include organization builder, guest, leader, member, assistant. Role of trainee. The trainee is a major stakeholder in a training program. The whole training program is developed for the trainees only. Each candidate plays an important role in the transfer of training because one participant's attitude regarding the training influences the other participant and also each participant can assist by advancing the learning process to realize the training objectives. Role of trainer. The effective transfer of training depends a lot on the trainer, because it is the trainer only who can remove the mental block of trainee, motivate the trainee to learn, delete the negative perception about the trainee regarding the training. Besides all that, a lot depends on personality of trainer also. Now let's talk about the training assessment. A needs assessment is a systematic process for determining and addressing needs or gaps between current conditions and desired conditions or wants. The discrepancy between the current condition and wanted condition must be measured to appropriately identify the need. We've all been through training in our jobs before, but how did the organization decide that training was needed in the first place? In this video, we're going to briefly discuss how organizations decide what their learning needs are and whether those needs can be met through training. The process of systematically evaluating these needs is called needs assessment or sometimes needs analysis. Before getting into needs assessment, let's step back and look at the training as a three-phase process. In the first phase, the assessment phase, we take stock of what our organization's needs are that might be met through training. This will be the focus of the rest of the video. After we've determined our needs, we then move on to the implementation phase. Here, we develop our training program, or possibly choose a pre-existing one depending on our needs, and we actually deliver the training. Finally, we want to evaluate our program to ensure that it met our objectives. See the other video for a discussion on how to evaluate training success. Based on what we learn, we may then return to the implementation phase to improve our program for the future. Now I should note that this is a prescriptive model. In other words, it says what should happen in organizations. Sadly, most of the time, companies only focus on the actual delivery of training. In other words, training is often neither well-planned nor properly evaluated for quality. 
So let's take a look at the assessment phase. Deciding where our training needs are can happen at three levels. At the highest level is organizational analysis, which refers to looking at the organization's goals and determining whether training is part of the plan for achieving those goals. Upper level management usually decides what those goals are based on observed problems or strategic plans. The goal here is to align training efforts with the overarching set of objectives for that organization. Forward thinking organizations will also ensure that there's adequate support for the training, such as resources to make up for the employee's time away from the job while they're being trained, and supervisor support for employees to practice what they've learned in training. At the second level is task and KSAO analysis. Based on information about major tasks and responsibilities, as well as important KSAOs, we can decide which of these things we wouldn't expect new employees to have when they start working for us. This might include working with job-specific pieces of equipment or knowing company policies and procedures. We can then move forward with the development of a training program to get them up to speed on these tasks or to provide them with these KSAOs. This may sound familiar to you, it might sound a lot like job analysis, and yes, job analysis would be a perfect source of this kind of information. And note that task and KSAO analysis identifies training that everyone in a particular position will need. It's not focused on an individual person. For that, we go to the third level, which is person analysis. As the name implies, person analysis focuses on what training needs particular employees might have. This type of analysis probably comes from some form of performance appraisal. During that process, deficiencies may be uncovered and that employee may be sent to training to bring him or her up to a satisfactory level. But person analysis doesn't always have a remedial flavor to it. It could be based on other needs. For example, a work group may need to have an expert on a particular topic and sending one member of the group to training may accomplish this. Also, training can often be used to groom someone for a future promotion to a higher level job. Finally, once the needs assessment has been conducted, the behavioral objectives of the training program should be specified. These objectives state what the desired outcome of the training is in terms of employee behavior. In other words, what should employees who go through the training be able to do now that they've gone through the training that they couldn't do before? So, for example, if a retail company is training employees to use a new cash register system, they might have the following behavioral objectives for the training program. First, be able to process cash credit or check transactions, be able to do this at a 95% accuracy rate, and use proper voiding procedures in case of an error. Whatever the behavioral objectives are, stating them clearly and in advance will help you to choose and design an appropriate training program. It will also help you be clear with the trainees about what they will be able to do once they complete the program. It will allow you to properly evaluate the success of the program since you've already specified what trainees should be able to do. And finally, it will help you better sell your plan to management. That's it for this video on training needs assessment. Thanks for watching. Did you know? Consider that the father of needs assessment, Roger Kaufman, first developed a model for determining needs defined as a gap in results. Organizational analysis. Organizational analysis and planning focuses on cultivating and maintaining an efficient workforce through the design and structure of an organization, as well as the relationships and behavior of individuals within organizations. Models of organizational analysis. Modeling enables managers to determine the crucial variables in particular circumstances so they can experiment with different combinations of variables to achieve their desired results. Task analysis. Task analysis, regardless of how it is defined, is an integral part, probably the most integral part, of the instructional development process. All instructional development models to date include some task analysis procedures. Most developers indicate that a poorly executed task analysis will jeopardize the entire development process. Individual analysis. To allow individual users to tailor the benchmarking in the optimal way without compromising on analytical standards, 
one has embedded state-of-the-art methods in easy-to-use software. Competency mapping is a process of identifying key competencies for a particular position in an organization, and then using it for training and development, performance management, and succession planning. Benefits. The benefits of competency mapping are key competencies for a particular position in an organization. It helps to identify the knowledge and skill that the employee requires in functioning in a job role, effectively and efficiently. It ensures that relevant training is provided. Origin of management with competency mapping. The most recent global talent management and reward study conducted by the leading professional services firm Towers Watson found out that one of the key challenges that organizations face is that many managers are stretched beyond their ability to perform, often having insufficient time to handle the people aspects of their job and feeling unsupported in the process. Types of competencies. The word competencies is used in many contexts with very different meanings. Basically, competencies fall into three categories or types. Organizational competencies. Job role competencies. Personal competencies. Organizational competencies. Unique factors that make an organization competitive. Job role competencies. Things an individual must demonstrate to be effective in a job, role, function, task, or duty. An organizational level or in the entire organization. Personal competencies. Aspects of an individual that imply a level of skill, achievement, or output. Levels of competency. The four level of competencies are First stage, unconscious incompetence. In this stage, a person is unaware of the existence of a particular skill. Since he is unaware of the skill, he does not know about its utility and relevance. Second stage, conscious incompetence. A person in this stage is aware of his incompetence and the usefulness of the particular skill he is lacking in. He knows that acquiring the skill will definitely improve his effectiveness in that front. Incapability of the person to perform a skill-specific task will make him realize its importance and motivate him to learn it. Third stage, conscious competence. A person is at this stage when he can perform the skill but not well enough to teach someone. Enough practice is required to reach to the level of unconscious competence. The person can perform a task using the skill, but needs to recollect the steps and think about them. Fourth stage, unconscious competence. In this stage, the person can perform the skill on his own. No assistance is required and the person can automatically perform the skill. He gets proficient enough to perform multiple tasks at the same time. Teaching the skill to another person now becomes an easy task for him. Critical Incidence Technique Flanagan developed the Critical Incidence Technique for job analysis purposes, with the aim of identifying the critical requirements for job success. The Critical Incident Technique consists of a set of procedures for collecting direct observations of human behavior. Although it is a qualitative research method, the CIT was initially posed as a scientific tool to help uncover existing realities or truths so they could be measured, predicted, and ultimately controlled within the realm of job and task analysis ideas that are rooted in predominant quantitative research tradition of the day. Use of the term incident in critical incidents. By an incident, it is meant that any observable human activity that is sufficiently complete in itself to permit interferences and predictions to be made about the person performing the act. Competency evaluation. Who performs the evaluation? Best practice. It is a best practice for the evaluator to be a licensed psychologist or psychiatrist with forensic training and or certification in performing competency evaluations including continuing education in forensic evaluations. Assessment tools. Best practice. It is a best practice for the well-qualified mental health professional to determine which, if any, clinical assessment tools is appropriate for competency evaluation. 
Now in the end, let us summarize what we have learned in this lecture. The economy has become global and is driven by innovations and technology, and organizations have to transform themselves to serve new customer expectations. The training department requires information about competency learning to determine the effectiveness of training delivery and approach. Observation is another evaluation method that provides information regarding employee reactions to the training. Many training organizations do not perform at the level they should because they are not focused on process management. The effective transfer of training depends a lot on the trainer because it is the trainer only who can remove the mental block of trainee, motivate the trainee to learn, delete the negative perception of the trainee regarding the training.